In this online lecture, we are going to be talking about the Etruscans. Now I have to be honest with you. When I record these online lectures, I try to take it down a notch. I try to behave myself. I try to keep my discussion regarding aliens to an absolute minimum because I do put these lectures online. They are available for the public, I'm trying to spread the message of art history in any way that I can. And so I don't want to get a reputation amongst the scholarly community as being some sort of crazy crackpot art historian. <clears throat> However, I don't know how well I'm going to be able to behave myself with this lecture. Because if there's one thing I'm passionate about, it's the Etruscans. And the reason why is because I don't think the Etruscans get the credit they deserve. And I don't usually have a theme to my lectures, but I do have a theme to my Etruscan lecture, and that is the Etruscans deserve more credit. Now, the Etruscans are the cultural forefathers of the Romans. They're kind of like what the Aegeans were to the Greeks. The Aegeans occupied the same geographical region that will be occupied with the civilization that we will eventually know to be Greece. And because of this, we see a very clear transmission of influence from the Aegeans to the Greeks. It's the same situation here, where you have the Etruscans occupying the Italian peninsula that will eventually become Rome. Now, not a lot of people know about the Etruscans, and this is something that makes me very sad and it keeps me awake at night. I think the reason why is because Rome is so sexy. They are, uh, you know, it's a dramatic culture. They went out, they took over all these regions in the ancient world. They had gladiatorial combat, all of the things. And so people are like, ooh, let's hurry up and talk about Rome. No, let's not hurry up and talk about Rome. Let's first talk about the Etruscans. In fact, you can't truly understand Rome until you understand the Etruscans because the Etruscans were so influential in many of Rome's artistic practices, particularly in architecture. Now, something that complicates this is that we don't know a lot about the Etruscans, or at least not as much as we would like to. There's two reasons for this. First of all, the Etruscans occupy that weird gray intermediate area between prehistoric and historic cultural designations. Technically, they are historic because they did have the written word. However, the written word has not been translated to the extent where we can actually glean valuable historical information. So that kind of makes them prehistoric in that sense. The other problem is, is that the Etruscans didn't really work with very durable materials that stood the test of time. So we don't have a lot of art from the Etruscans that has survived archaeologically. Now they did have a very robust artistic tradition of bronze sculpture, which we know bronze actually does stand the test of time. However, in the ancient world there was an unfortunate practice of recycling, and so it was very common for Etruscan bronze work to be melted down to be repurposed into Roman sculpture. So that's kind of unfortunate as well. There are some things, though, we do know about the Etruscans, okay? What we know is that archaeological evidence indicates they began to settle onto the Italian peninsula as early as the year 1000 BCE. Now, where they came from, we're not quite sure. There's a lot of theories, but there's no scholarly consensus. So this remains one of these enthralling mysteries of the ancient world, which is why I like to study the ancient world. We don't know where they're coming from. Now they settled, as you can see on the map, in what is the northwest area of the Italian peninsula. We call this area Etruria, and today this is modern day Tuscany. Now this already is an example of how wonderful and smart the Etruscans are. They only pick Tuscany, or what will become Tuscany, the most beautiful area in all of Italy to settle in. Now we know that they were accomplished traders. This is something that was helped by the geography. You can see from the map all of the water. So they get in their boats, they drive around, and they trade. And you can see evidence of their trading in the artistic influences 
of their art. The Etruscans are particularly influenced by Egyptian art. They are also influenced by Greek art, and there also is evidence of them being influenced by Aegean, particularly Minoan traditions as well. Now, one of the things about Etruscan trading is that not only did the geography help them with their trading, but where they did, decided to settle down was a very mineral rich area. So they actually had a lot of commodities that other areas really wanted. There was a demand. And so what happened is, is it made um, the Etruscans very wealthy once they were able to establish their trade infrastructure. Now here's another thing I like about the Etruscans. They are able to really grow their economy through trade. And what we see, or what our evidence is indicating, is that there was a relatively equal distribution of wealth. Now this is not to say that there was no hierarchy, there was, but we don't see the kind of unequal levels of hierarchy that we see in other ancient cultures. That they had a relatively high standard of living that the vast majority of Etruscans were able to enjoy. So they shared the wealth. And this is what I like about the Etruscans. They're a good group of people. They share with one another. There is evidence that there is a relative equality with gender. And you're going to come to see in a lot of the tomb painting and sarcophagi imagery, they like to just hang around and have a good time. They're just a happy, nice, positive group of people. Enjoy these feels because when we get to Rome, not quite the same. It becomes a little more intense. Now the other thing we know about the Etruscans is we do have a sense of their political organization, which is also something that's addressed in this map. They were uh, distributed in these sort of autonomous political entities that we can refer to as city-states. But there was still a level of continuity. It seems as though the Etruscans, despite being separate in these city-states, they did speak a similar language and they did have similar religious beliefs. They were just separate politically. And a lot of scholars said that the uh, separate political system of the Etruscans was what allowed for it to so easily be overtaken by Rome and absorbed into the empire. And of course, this was a process that happened over time, but scholars say it was around the third century BCE that the Etruscans um, were absorbed by Rome. All right, let's take a look at some art produced by the Etruscans. So here we have a model of an Etruscan temple. This is not obviously ruins that we're looking at and we're looking at a model because unfortunately there are no more freestanding Etruscan temples for us to study. This is because the uh, primary material that Etruscans used to build their architecture was tufa. And tufa is a kind of volcanic rock. It's strong enough obviously to build a building off, you know, out of, but it's not something that's going to stand the test of time. So the question is, well, how is it then that we can create these models with a sense of accuracy that can make us comfortable? The answer to this is in two parts. One, we do have uh, the writings of a first century BCE Roman architect named Vitruvius. Now Vitruvius wrote this book on architecture and thankfully he included a chapter on Etruscan temple design. These writings are very valuable to us because he's writing them in the first century so likely Etruscan ruins at this time were still standing that he could directly observe them and record their specificities in his uh, treatise. So thank you Vitruvius. The other thing is that the Etruscans did build their temples on stone bases, and the stone bases have lasted. So we can look at the bases, and that can give us a sense of the, the design. Now, if I had to define Etruscan temple design in one sentence as a sort of summary, this is what I would say. This is very important. This will help you to understand the nuances of Etruscan architecture. What I would say is this, Etruscan temples show a mix of Greek and Etruscan features. Etruscan temples show a mix of Greek and Etruscan features. 
Now, let's take this as an opportunity for you to do a little review. You know about Greek temples. You understand what's temple, typical of a Greek temple design. What I would like you to do is to take your notes and go back to your notes on the Parthenon. Okay, the Parthenon was a Greek structure, dates to the classical period, located on the Acropolis. And that is a fairly, fairly typical Greek temple. Take your notes, maybe even look up on your phone a picture of the Pantheon and compare it to what you see here. Pause the video and take a minute to determine what you see here that is Greek and what you see here that would, is not. Okay, so hopefully you've done that. Let's talk about it. First, let's talk about what is Greek. Now, a lot of times what my students will say is they'll say that the columns are Greek, that they look like they're Doric. This is okay. I will accept this. Now, technically, they're not Doric because they're missing something. What are these columns missing? Fluting. They're missing fluting. Now, because they don't have fluting, technically, these are, um, become Tuscan orders, which is considered to be a Roman or you could even say an Etruscan order. But I'm perfectly fine. I will sleep fine in my bed tonight knowing that my students think Doric col Tuscan columns are Doric. It's fine. It's not a deal. So here we have, we'll just say Doric-ish columns, Greek. Now what we can also see up here is a pediment, okay, our triangle roof. So these are our Greek features. Now what is now typically not part of a typical Greek temple? One of the things you may have noticed is that down here we have a singular staircase. And I apologize that this is cut off in the photograph. One staircase that leads up. And then you can see that the rest of the temple sits on a base. And this is different from a Greek temple where the stairs tend to go all the way around. The reason why the stairs go all the way around in a Greek temple is because the Greeks did not emphasize temple entryways. So not only do the stairs go all the way around, but what else went all the way around? The columns. Here though we see that our columns are constrained only to the front, which functions to emphasize the entryway. And this really is important to emphasize entryway. This is something that makes Etruscan architecture distinct from the Greeks, but also you will see it's going to make Roman architecture distinct from Greek architecture. And it's important for us to identify this distinction because otherwise Greek and Roman architecture is really similar. So the emphasize entryway. Now the other thing is the, the sculpture on the roof. Do you remember where we typically see sculpture on a Greek temple? There's two places. The frieze, which is on the entablature, and the pediment. Here, though, we see it on the roof. Now, this is not to say that the Greeks didn't put sculpture on the roof. They did, but they didn't do it to the extent that the Etruscans did. Now, for you as an art historian in training, one thing I understand is that it might be easier for you to understand differences between architectural styles in more absolute terms, which is fine. We'll do that here. We'll say that the, the Etruscans put their sculpture on the roof, the Greeks put their sculpture on the pediment and the frieze. Now, this is an example of an Etruscan sculpture that was be found on the roof, okay? This is uh, Apollo, okay? which we know is a Greek god and may evidence to us that with Etruscan religion, which we don't have a ton of information about, that it probably involves some sort of syncretism, combining their indigenous relief, indigenous religious beliefs with influence coming from the Greeks. And of course, we know that the Romans perpetuate that, adopt a lot of Greek uh, religious features as well. Now, before we talk about the specifics, does this sculpture remind you of any sculptural style that we've looked at before in this class? Look closely. Does this seem familiar? If you said the Greek archaic Kouros figure, you would be correct. We do see a lot of similarities between Etruscan sculpture and Greek archaic sculpture. 
And if you look at the date, circa 500 BCE, this is relatively contemporary with archaic period Greek. Contemporary meaning these two cultures are existing at the same time. What we can see in terms of commonality is we see a stylized treatment of the hair, although this is like kind of like thicker sort of dreadlock situation rather than the tight, uh, perfectly patterned hair that we see from our Kuros figure. We also see the archaic smile. We see the idea of the stepping forward. However, there are some differences here, and these are differences I think that are important to address. Obviously, our Etruscan sculpture is not a carbon copy of our Greek Kuros figure. So what is different? Okay, now first of all, obviously this figure is clothed. Let's take a look at the drapery. Okay, the drapery is stylized. You can see that there's this kind of perfect patterning that's not exactly uh, realistic in, it, in its representation of cloth, which is irregular and it bunches and it folds and it wrinkles as it sits on the body. Now we know that in the archaic period, we looked at the Kure figure, that we see that stylized treatment of cloth as well. But one thing that we see in our Etruscan sculpture that we do not see in um, our Greek archaic examples is that the cloth does function to reveal form, right? We can see all sorts of parts of the body underneath the, the cloth. And if you think back to the Kore figure, the female version of our Kuros figure, remember that cloth just hung down in a heavy mass. You couldn't see her legs underneath. So this is a little bit more of a sophisticated representation of cloth than what we were seeing in the um, archaic period. The other thing that's different is we have here uh, a stiffness to the figure with the arms clenched, or the fist clenched, arms down at the side, step forward with the awkward locked knee. Now here, the figure is actually walking. We have the arm out, which kind of activates the sculpture, gives it a sense of energy and a forward, you know, forward moving motion. This is not a contrapposto stance, okay? It's somebody walking with their knees bent, which is naturalistic, right? That's how we walk, we bend our knees. So this is interesting to me because when we think about the Greeks, you know, everybody says, oh my gosh, the Greeks, so sophisticated, the pioneers of sculpture. And I say that as well. However, I clarify that by saying they become the pioneers of sculpture really in what I would say is the Hellenistic period. Here, okay, I would say that our Etruscan example is a much more sophisticated example, a much more technologically impressive sculpture in comparison to our Kouros figure. And so what people say is, oh, the Greeks influenced the Etruscans. See, here you go. But here's what I urge you to consider. Think about how this actually is a little bit more sophisticated than what the Greeks were doing. We see things here in this sculpture that the Greeks do not begin to do until the classical period, which is later. Things like cloth revealing form. But here's something else. Look at these legs. Look at this. You have a calf muscle that's flexed. Here are awkward tube legs. Here you have a foot that steps up and the foot is flexing and you see the tendons. All of these minute details that do not really begin to see a regular presence until at the earliest, maybe the end of the classical period. So I want to suggest that maybe it's the Etruscans actually that are influencing the Greeks. And then when we see the true revolution of sculpture, that with, with the Greeks are rightly known for, that that actually is inspired by the Etruscans, and it is not truly a Greek attribute. And this is why I say that the Etruscans deserve more credit. The other thing, look at the sense of energy, the sense of life, the sense of vitality. This person is alive. And I love that about Etruscan art, is that, that sense of energy and vitality. 
not quite something that's being communicated here or in other types of archaic sculpture either. What is the takeaway? The Etruscans deserve more credit because they very well may have been the true pioneers of sculpture, not the Greeks. Okay, let's move on to, to uh, tombs. Tombs are really important in our study of the Etruscans because so much of the artwork that we have to study from the Etruscans has been taken from the tombs. We're only going to look at one tomb and we're looking at a plan of this tomb. This is a plan of the tomb of the shields and chairs, which dates to approximately the 6th century BCE. Now the type of tombs that Etruscans most commonly built were mounded tombs, which we know is one of the most prolific tomb types in the ancient world. And because the mounded tomb is so common in the ancient world, we do need to clarify and very often we give specific names to mounded tombs based on the culture that constructed them. For the Etruscans, their mounded tomb we refer to as a tumulus, or if you're referring to in the plural, tumuli. Now what makes the Etruscan tumuli unique in comparison to other mounded tombs, like for example the Mycenaean Tholos or um, the Cairn from the Neolithic period, is that the tumulus takes the form of an Etruscan home. Now this is very valuable information to us because this gives us a lot of evidence regarding Etruscan daily life. The other thing that's interesting about Etruscan tombs, the tumuli were built in groups and we call a grouping of tombs a necropolis. This is not necessarily unique. A lot of ancient cultures built necropoli. An example, for example, are the Egyptians who very often group their mastaba in necropoli. Now what's interesting about the Etruscan necropoli is that they seem to, in many instances, replicate residential neighborhoods. So the tombs are in the shape of the home, the tombs are organized as a residential neighborhood, which also provides us with valuable insight regarding Etruscan city planning. Now, what kind of evidence does these uh, tumuli give to us regarding how the Etruscans lived? Well, what that indicates to us is that the Etruscans lived a more sort of communal life where what we see are extended family groups that would be occupying a large home. This is our entryway into the home. And then here we have the central area where a lot of the day-to-day -day living would occur. This home, other similar to it, would be occupied by extended family groups. You'd have like a husband and wife and their children, and then maybe like the husband's parents, like the sisters, or the wife's sister and her husband and their kids, that kind of situation. And these would be the different rooms that would be occupied by the more immediate family groups. So there's a little separation, but everyone kind of lives together in this central area. Now, of course, these tombs had all kinds of accessories that would typically populate an Etruscan home, and this gives us a lot of really valuable information as well. Now, the Etruscans did paint their tombs, but this was not a very common practice. This is one of the very rare ways in which we actually can ascertain a sense of hierarchy. It is the tombs of the more wealthier individuals that will feature paintings. This is an example here. Now this is a great painting for us to look at because there's a lot of things in here that we've already encountered in uh, previous lectures. This is a great opportunity for review. Okay, I highly suggest to uh, pause the video and to conduct an iconographical analysis. What do you see in this painting that you've seen in art that we've looked at throughout this semester? So pause the video, look very closely and see what you can identify that seems familiar. Okay, so hopefully you've done that. Let's talk about what we see here. Start at the top, we'll work our way down. This is the Tomb of the Leopards, and it's named so because we have these two feline uh, animals in profile here at the top register. 
Now, this is symbolism. Can you recall what feline uh, animals typically symbolize in art? Protection. So likely these are here to protect the deceased, the, the people who are in the, in the tombs. Now let's look down in here, okay? So you have these people reclining, okay? What we're looking at is we're looking at a banqueting scene. This is the, one of the most common subjects that we see in Etruscan funerary art, banqueting scenes, which basically is a party. People come together, they eat food, and they get wasted. Now the way that they eat, and this is a dining custom that continues into ancient Rome, is they eat laying down. So they're reclining on these couches, and they are eating and they're drinking. And this is the Etruscan conception of the afterlife. For them, the afterlife is a party where you sit around and you're with your friends and you eat food and you drink libations. I am on board with this. This sounds like a great way to spend eternity. The Etruscans are so great. They just want to have fun and enjoy each other in the afterlife. Now, let's take a look right in here. Okay, you might notice a difference in skin tone. Okay, now we know that that is an indication of gender, right? Because women, typically, this is the, the idea, would be indoors. Their skin is not as uh, exposed to the sun, where men are outside in the public realm with which they're most frequently affiliated. This skin is darker. Now we can appreciate this, particularly in this painting, because it's not really any other distinctions of gender. This lady even has a sideburn, and we don't see like anatomy or anything like that. So we know that there's men and women. Okay, what else do we see here? A lot of plants, okay? Now you know this uh, as well. When you look at uh, plant imagery in the context of burial, what does that represent? Rebirth. There's another thing that represents rebirth in this painting, and it's this. This is a food item. Can you guess what it is? What is round? What is white? That something that you eat that could be symbolic of rebirth. It's an egg. So we've got that as well. Now the other thing that we're actually seeing, and this is kind of tricky, is we're seeing some uh, reflections of hierarchy through hierarchical scale. It's the tricky hierarchical scale, the kind that we saw, for example, on the Stele of Hammurabi. They're laying down, right? People are coming up to them to serve them, but they're the same size. In reality, these figures should loom over them. But because of hierarchical scale, they're the same size. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is nudity. Now, we know that nude ma male nudity is really complex in art, and it can mean a lot of different things. You have to uh, pay attention to the context. Here, because we're looking at these images of serving, the nudity is also likely uh, meant to represent hierarchy, that these people are of a lesser status, uh, which is indicated by the nudity and the fact that they're serving them, as well as the use of hierarchical scale. I think that that is all. Let's move on. Let's look at some other examples of funerary art. Now, in terms of Etruscan burial, okay, they practiced cremation. But they didn't just like put a pile of ashes in a tomb because the tombs are kind of almost like today's mausoleums where they're going in and out and they're putting people's remains in as they're passing away because these are group tombs. So they would um, put their ashes in repositories and there's three different types that they would use for ashes. One, an urn, which you'll see here. Uh, two, a sarcophagus, which we're going to look at in a minute, and then three, a sculpture, which I'm not going to show you examples of, but there are examples in your book. So these are the three repositories for the ashes. Now here we have an urn. Now the urn, this also um, was replicating an Etruscan home. Now if you look at the urn though, this might seem really different than the um, plan that we looked at earlier of the Tomb of the Shields and Chairs. This is a much larger multi-room structure. This is basically a thatched hut. Now if you look at the date, this can be instructive. Circa 800 BCE. Now remember that the Etruscans don't really show up on the scene until around the year 1000. So in around 800 BCE, this is still a relatively young civilization. 
likely they had not yet at this point really established trade infrastructure. And so we're not seeing that more robust economy uh, that shows wealth and high standard of living. The tomb of the shields and chairs, which dates to the 6th century, this is when the Etruscan civilization is roughly at its height, and that wealth is better represented. But what we can see is that the, uh, the, the daily life remains the same, and that it's primarily communal. And that the family, not an extended family, but an entire you know, immediate family grouping, would occupy this one room structure. Now here we have um, a sarcophagus. This is the second type of repository. Now again, even though this is a sarcophagus, a coffin, it, they wouldn't put a body in there. This is not like in Egypt where there would be a mummy. Again, it's cremation. Now this is though similar to Egypt in that what Egypt did, and you read about this in your book uh, when you looked at um, the sarcophagus for King Tut, King Tutankhamun, is that they would put images of the deceased on the uh, on the on the coffin. Now the difference is is the Egyptian portrait of the deceased lays flush flat on the coffin, so you have to stand over it and look down to see the representation of the individual. Where with the Etruscan, as you can see, they put the depiction of the individuals as sculptures in the round atop the sarcophagus. This is a um, a sarcophagus tradition that will be perpetuated by the Romans. Now what we see is that then obviously this sarcophagus contains the remains of two people which look like a man and a wife. The scene here is where the, the sarcophagus would open. It would open from the sides so they would put whoever's ashes in first. They would not want to have the um, lid lifted off because that would damage this sculpture. This sculpture is made of terracotta, it's made of clay, which is one of the more common materials that the Etruscans used. The Apollo sculpture that we looked at in the previous slide, also made of clay. Again, clay, not super durable, so this is why we don't have a lot of Etruscan sculptures. This is probably the most famous of the Etruscan sculptures, um, and that is because clearly it is particularly fabulous. Now if we look, we can see that similar to our Apollo sculpture, there is a stylistic affinity, I'm not saying who influenced who, but you know where I stand, between Etruscan and archaic Greek art. This one even has more clear, like, clear stylistic um, similarities, because this one has that more tighter braided hair, the archaic smile. Also we see this sort of frontal stiff positioning, which using that to depict someone laying down is what makes this look really awkward. They're kind of just like this lump of a body that sort of, you know, transitions from seated to standing. If you look really close, you can see that this is not naturalistic at all. So we have these two people and they're depicted in a banqueting scene. So the same sort of subject matter that we saw in the Tomb of the Leopards. If you look at their hands, they're really like specifically uh, depicted, which is indicating that likely they were originally holding things. So he probably was holding like a cup full of wine, maybe she was holding a plate. So they're reclining, they are at the party, they're eating, they're enjoying one another. We get a sense that he's older because we have the beard, and if you look closely you can see that gender is also articulated through the subtle differences in skin tone. To me it seems like these are more wealthier um, individuals. She wears some sort of headdress, and it's kind of hard to see here, take my word for it, her shoes actually are really fashionable and really fabulous. So not only are the Etruscans um, really great people, like to have a good time, they clearly um, understood fashion, which is something I certainly can appreciate. Now here's the other thing that I really admire about the Etruscans, is that they seem to actually genuinely love each other. Look at this image here. You have them reclining on the same bed. There's a close physical proximity and actually if you look at the sculpture from behind you can see that she, and you can look this up online, she actually leans into him. He, they're touching. He puts her, his arm around her in um, 
you know, this kind of gesture of affection. This sculpture is interesting um, because it's actually, or this photograph is missing um, a part here. In the reconstruction of this um, sculpture, what scholars have been able to determine is the hand actually extends palm up and rests lightly on her forearm. It's this really kind of subtle, but I think very beautiful gesture of connection and affection. Now for me, I am a romantic and I love this idea of an artwork that shows love, that shows affection, because this actually is so rare. We see so few examples in the ancient world of love. Oftentimes, marriage was something that was arranged. It was something that was seen as a kind of economic transaction, maybe for political purposes if you're looking at more upper class individuals. But what we see again and again and again in Etruscan art is that these people married for love, that they loved each other. We have an example um, in your book that shows a sarcophagus. And on the lid of the sarcophagus, the couple is engaged in sexy time. And this is what they want to do for uh, all of eternity, is just be with each other in this intimate way. It's a very beautiful thing. Now here's another Etruscan sarcophagus, and this is a, a later one, and you can see that from the date, early 2nd century BCE. Now this is around the time that the Etruscans were um, kind of at their very end, uh, where the absorption into the Roman Empire was more or less complete. Now we can tell that this is a later Etruscan sarcophagus for two reasons. One, it's made of stone. We typically see later Etruscan sarcophagi in stone. But two, what we also see is that there is a little bit more of a somber vibe. At the end of the existence of the Etruscans, their work does not have that sense of um, vitality, energy, happiness uh, that we have seen so far in these other examples of art. It's much more serious. And that makes sense. This is a, a culture that's really seeing it, itself come to an end. And uh, that surely made these people very sad and very uncomfortable. And I think actually this is a great example. So here we have this guy, Lars, who is reclining. Now, even though he's reclining, he's not at a banquet. He's not at a party having a good time. Clearly, this guy is not having a good time. He kind of like looks out, sort of melancholy, staring off into space. Now, he has in front of him a scroll. And what scholars believe is that written on that scroll is a list of his life's accomplishments. Now, this is actually important if you think about it. Because when you look at sculptures like these, these are indicating this idea of optimism, of looking forward and ahead. Hey, we are super excited about this afterlife where we get to sit around with the people we love and enjoy a party for all of eternity. Here, what he's doing is actually he's reflecting back into the past, looking back on his life rather than optimistically looking forward to a fun-filled afterlife. Now, there's something else that I think is really telling about this, you know, more somber feel, and it's down in here. Now, this is something that we see in later Etruscan sarcophagi, and this is something that certainly is going to be picked up by the Romans, as we will see, is this idea of putting relief sculpture on the bottom part of the sarcophagus. Now what is traditional is that the very middle of the, um, the, the relief sculpture will depict another portrait of the deceased, which would be right in here. Now his head is missing, but what was um, being depicted here is actually two demons, one on either side, that is bashing in this man's head. This is a really interesting choice for imagery on one sarcophagus. I personally don't know if I would make this choice, uh, but this is what Lars has chosen. Why? Nobody knows. Maybe he is expressing a sense of guilt. Maybe he didn't live his life in a very honest way. Maybe that's why he's not looking forward to the afterlife. We cannot say, uh, but it definitely contributes to this really more intense kind of somber feel that is typical in later Etruscan art. And we are going to end with the Capitoline Wolf. I have one example to show you of a bronze sculpture. This sculpture is easily as fabulous as the other sculptures that we have looked at. It's this really nice Etruscan balance of the stylized and the realistic. If you look here, we've got a stylized treatment of the hair on this animal. 
We've got uh, not the most realistic depiction of the face, but then we have these really sophisticated, beautifully nuanced aspects of realism. Look at the shoulder and the muscle it's flexed as this fierce animal stands. Look at the ribs that subtly poke out from the side. They're not doing this in Greece yet at this point, may I just remind you. Beautifully sophisticated artwork. Love it. We've got this fierceness, this sense of energy, this sense of vitality that's really similar to uh, that energy that we saw in the Apollo sculpture. These babies are interesting. Stylistically, they don't seem to go along with the other types of sculpture that we've looked at in this lecture. And that's because they do not belong to the Etruscans. This is a later addition that was added to this sculpture of a wolf in the Renaissance era. Now, probably originally there were baby wolves. Okay, clearly you can see that she's a new mother, that probably she was feeding her wolves. This is probably why she's fierce, she's guarding, she's protecting. They were removed and then added in these little babies. Why the change? This likely is a reference to the mythical origins of Rome. So there is this belief that Rome was founded by two brothers, Romulus and Remus. Basically, these guys were hooligans, and uh, what they did is they um, took over a hill. It's Capitoline Hill. Why it's called the Capitoline Wolf. Capitoline Hill is, I think, the most significant of the, f I think it's five major hills in Rome. And this is supposedly where all of Rome began. So they go on this hill, and they get a bunch of other, like, hooligans, and they uh, go out, and from that hill as their sort of like base, they go and they start to take over, and it grows and grows and eventually becomes the Roman Empire. The idea, though, is that these brothers, they were um, originally abandoned by their mother, who left them out. Uh, she didn't, um, she wasn't able to keep them, so she left them out to uh, die, to be eaten by animals. And then the she-wolf comes along, rescues them and she feeds them and then they grow up to become the founders of Rome. So this concludes our lecture on the Etruscans who clearly, as I think you can see, deserve more credit.